Good afternoon, everyone. This is Representative Carolyn Partridge coming you, to you from my snowy home in Wyndham, Vermont. And it is February 2nd, 2021. And we are here to talk about animal welfare and animal shelter in particular. And um, we're going to start off. Uh, and, and Maddie, you, you can lead off here. And I don't, do people know, should we introduce ourselves? I, I think we've introduced ourselves to some of you, but maybe not everybody. So would that be a good idea? Yeah, okay. All right, so I'll go around the tiles and I'll start with Rodney. Rodney Graham from my snowy home in Williamstown. <laughs> and I represent Orange One District, Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Corinth, Mercer, and Chelsea. Thank you, Rodney. Heather? Hi, all. I'm Heather Supernaut. I represent Barnard, Pomfret, Queechy, and West Hartford. Thank you, Vicki. Good afternoon. I'm Representative Vicki Strong, and I live in Albany. I'm glad I'm not driving to the State House and home today. It's nice to be with you on Zoom. And I represent seven towns in Orleans, Caledonia One. <laughs> All right, thanks, Vicki. Go ahead, Tom. I'm Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and part of North Springfield. John. Good afternoon. I can see I have to rename myself. Uh, I'm representative John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. Thanks, John. Terry. Uh, Terry Norris, I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. And I'm Representative Carolyn Partridge. I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. And so why don't we get started? Maddie, uh, if you want to say some introductory remarks, that would be great. I have a list of people who are going to go. Graham Unex, Rufinock would be next. Um, but if you want to, you know, switch things up, it's okay with me. This is your time, and we have you for about an hour. I want to make sure everybody gets included in the discussion. So, um, oh, where's Henry? Oh, Henry, sorry. Thank you, Rodney. All right, I'm easy to forget. Um, no, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> Representative Henry Pearl, I uh, represent Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. All right. I apologize, Henry. I was going around the tiles and they must have switched or something. Anyway, go ahead, Maddie. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Partridge and, and the committee for having us. I'm Maddie Kempner. I'm the policy director at NOFA Vermont. Um, and I will keep it short because I really want to prioritize hearing from all the farmers uh, who have made time to be here today. Thank you all so much for being here too. Um, I also have chatted with Graham and we would love it if possible for Grant to reserve a few minutes for Graham to testify at the end um, to wrap up our, our testimony after the, far the other farmers have spoken. Um, so if that works for you all, that would be great. Um, so just a little bit of background, we know, I mean, I know, and I think everyone here on the call knows that the committee worked fairly extensively on this bill last session, uh, and we really appreciate the opportunity today to bring in additional farmer voices whose operations are impacted by the language that was passed last year to share um, their thoughts on this, on this law. And um, we you know, I think we've had one meeting, I'll give you some background with uh, many of the farmers, but not all the farmers on this call to discuss this language and um, hear from the farming community about, you know, how this language has, has impacted them or how they see it impacting them in the future. Um, and I just want to share that collectively, we really want to see language that protects animal health and welfare. That's really important to all the farmers that we have spoken with on this issue um, and while supporting progressive management intensive grazing practices. Um, and I will also just share that some of the farmers who are here to testify today have been animal welfare certified in the past, um, which I just share as a testament to the importance of animal welfare to farmers in Vermont, um, both those who have been certified and not. And so I will share some language that we have developed um, in collaboration with many of the farmers here, as well as uh, a broader list of folks in the ag community. Um, I can just figure out how to share my screen here. Give me one second. Okay. Can y'all see that okay? Yep. Okay, excellent. So 
This is some language that um, we developed collectively. Many of the folks, like I said, um, here on the call today were included in developing this language. And really, um, it's modeled after the National Organic Program regulations as they relate to adequate shelter for livestock. Um, and as you know, the National Organic, as you probably know, the National Organic Program um, really emphasizes needing to have animals grazing on pasture for a minimum number of days per season. And so uh, as such, I think is a good framework to start with when we think about you know, what is appropriate for animal health and welfare that are being, for animals that are predominantly maintained outdoors. So we have, um, made some adjustments to the existing language and the one of the major things that we have adjusted is to just define adequate shelter more broadly um, versus the two categories that are in the language right now which define both constructed and natural shelter separately um, and this is also up on the committee webpage, so y'all can dig into it further later i don't want to spend too much time on it uh, that's one of the main changes that we have suggested here the other is to really define inclement weather um, and try to put some more more sort of guardrails on, you know, what types of weather warrant uh, livestock of different species needing to have access to shelter um, during, you know, during that weather and during periods of inclement weather specifically versus the language right now, um, which really indicates that livestock have to have access to adequate natural or built shelter um, essentially at all times to prevent direct exposure to the elements, which I think folks, a lot of folks were feeling was, um, excessively broad in that, you know, the elements could include things like sunshine um, or, or rain, which aren't necessarily problematic um, in their lesser extremes to many livestock species. So that's just a brief overview of the language that we've developed. And I will, sh I will say also that we have had some pretty, um, pretty significant buy-in and agreement on that language across a broad spectrum of folks in that community. Um, many of the farmers here, like I said, have waited on that, plus folks, mm -hmm. farm leaders from both the organic and conventional um, communities within agriculture in Vermont. So it's um, something we would love to see you all take up. <coughs> and we, yeah. I'll leave that at that. And um, lastly, I just want to say, in making, in addition to making recommendations for revision, ugh, revisions, excuse me, to the language, we and many of the folks on this call are seeking clarity and transparency around the existing training, adjudication, and enforcement processes regarding this law. Um, and we are interested in engaging on that level as well, because we know there is a whole um, apparatus and many folks involved in the sort of enforcement and adjudication parts of this um, of this issue. So. I I will leave it there and pass it to the next farmer on the list. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Maddie, for giving us that uh, introduction. And the farmer on the list that I see, well, I see a gra grazing outreach specialist, Kimberly Hagen. Would you like her to go next? And we'll have Graham at the end. Sure. I think that works great if that <laughs> works for Kimberly. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I work with this whole group. We, um, I've been out on a number of calls in the last five years um, with uh, trying to resolve conflicts between farmers who are grazing their animals outdoors and law enforcement and a, a concerned neighbor or someone in the community that thinks that they are not grazing or dealing with their animals properly. And it is a gray area, it's fuzzy. Um, and I think we do need some clarification. Um, and I did work with this group. I, I like this langu new language, um, what we've come up with a little bit better. But I think what's, what's became clear to me is that, that there are people in our communities that no matter what you put in writing, um, they're going to find a way to get around that language um, if they feel like it's not being dealt with. And, we tried to do more educational work this past season, um, bringing, we did some across the fence episodes just to show people that, um, you know, animals indeed are much healthier when they are outside. They can tolerate conditions much different than what humans can. They are not human beings, they're animals. So I was taking more the approach of doing more education than trying to use um, language or a legal structure um, to deal with this, but I do think there might be a good place for having a team to work with some of these situations because they do get volatile pretty quickly, some of them. <laughs> I also want to point out, and this is um, something that you, the committee should be aware of, 
sometimes this puts farmers in direct conflict with two different um, state agencies. We have people who are dealing with neighbors who are telling them that they need to have their animals have some kind of place to get out of either the sun or the rain or the wind or whatever. And yet at the same time, if these farmers try to um, include small areas of woodland in their pasture areas, just for that very reason, for some shade or for wind protection, they um, sometimes are in violation of their current use. And I've had some actual farms have been fined for putting livestock in wooded areas. So it's just something to be aware of, um, something that I think that might have to be worked through in the future. Um, Kimberly, I, I think what I wanna do is hold questions till the end because I wanna make sure all the farmers get a chance to, to speak, but who, who imp I just have to clarify because if we're gonna follow up on this, I need to know who imposed these fines? It's you, you oh, um, sorry about that. Uh, it's actually the tax department because you're in violation of your current use. So current use either recognizes forest land or ag land. There's no in between. So if you put livestock into your forest land, you're in violation of your forestry current use plan. Hmm, very interesting. I know. I think, I think we're gonna have uh, Jill Remick in again. We can ask her about that. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, thank you so much, Kimberly, really appreciate it. Uh, so next person on the list here is Adam Wilson. Is Adam here? I don't see Adam. I think we might have to come back to him if he's able to join <clears throat> that's, later. That's fine. Joan Falcao or Falcao? Yes, I'm with Bob Fireoven. Okay, uh, okay, and I, if I murdered your last name, I apologize. <laughs> I have many pronunciations for that last name. <laughs> We're here in South Hero at Health Hero Farm, and we raise 100% grass-fed beef. We have a beautiful conserved property with large stretches of open land that grow beautiful grass. They used to be um, corn crops, and that's why they're so open. And it would take us 20 years probably to grow decent shade. We do have some shade around the periphery. My main concern is shade in the summer. We don't have trouble in the winter because of our uh, fortunate circumstance of having a very nice large barn from the previous owner. So the cattle can go in there when they want to. Now, right now they're not inside because it's, it's a mild temperature. They don't mind the snow. They, we have some woods nearby and they'd rather be in the woods than in the barn, even though they know where the barn is and they often go there to get um, some, some sips of water from our frost-free tanks there. So we're in there often enough that we know where they like to spend their time. And we also put up some cameras, some trail cameras to try to piece this puzzle together. So they like to be outside, they're very healthy. Uh, we were animal welfare approved, uh, but we, we opted out of the program because they did not allow us to buy in cattle that were not animal welfare approved cattle. They allow that for chickens, but not for cattle. So we thought having raised in Vermont was a better uh, label for our product than animal welfare improved, but we, we still continue the same practices. And in the animal welfare approved program, they're just fine with not having shelter at all times. There's no such requirement. Um, well, they say for extreme weather. I mean, I'll read to you from the AWA animal welfare approved standards for beef uh, production. Uh, animals who have been properly selected for specific climactic conditions will voluntarily choose to go outdoors in all but the most <laughs> extreme weather. And uh, frankly, we've seen that. Jo Joan mentioned today they're out in the snow uh, in the summertime. We have actually set up lanes in the fields for them to go back to the wooded areas in the very hot, most of the hottest days of the year. And often they just stay in the fields. They know that lane is there, but they 
would rather be where the forage is and where the water is. Um, they're very hardy. We've always, uh, whenever we've had audits, and, and when we were animal welfare approved certified, we would get audits every year. And the auditors, uh, we learned a lot from them about uh, how to take good care of our animals. Uh, but they never mentioned anything about how we uh, manage our grazing practices in the summertime or needed, shell needed uh, shade for them, especially. We do have places, fields where there is a lot of woods and we don't take the woods down. We, never, we, we don't plan on doing that at all. Um, and, uh, but again, it, we have had, for instance, we did do come some contract grazing a couple of years ago, and we had in a different breed of cattle, Galloways, who were bred in Canada. And I'll be honest with you, in the hottest days of the summer, they were uncomfortable uh, because they are bred to have two coats of uh, fur. And so they don't handle the heat as well as our cattle do. Um, and so I think that the animal welfare approved standards about factoring in uh, the uh, genetics of the animals is, is important. Um, we feel as though our animals, we've all been, we've been told by many people, our animals are very, a great condition, very healthy, and we see it too. It's rare for us to lose an animal. And the vet usually only comes in twice a year to do pregnancy checks, and then an animal might injure its hoof. And the vet will be called in to look at the hoof physical injury. But other than that, they're extremely healthy. We don't vaccinate, we don't need to do anything because they have very good immune systems and <clears throat> they're somewhat sequestered from threats from the environment. Beef cattle are a lot more robust than dairy cattle are. They're really tough buggers. And when we have had a sick uh, animal, um, we don't know about it until they're near death. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, that's only been once or twice, but uh, they're very hardy. So it would be a, a hardship for us to have to have, have to go out to our huge a fields where we roll tumble wheels to define these movable paddocks. It'd be difficult for us to make lanes so that at any time in perfectly good weather, these cattle would have a place to go to the woods or back to the barn where they don't want to be and would not go. Uh, so we'd like you to consider the Im importance of the specific animal and their needs. We think we're treating our animals very well and we look to their behavior to tell us and they're enjoying themselves out there today. So um, I think that's pretty, oh, and we have very good high quality bee. People see our animals and say, whoa, what great condition they are. They're very well fed and they enjoy a nice social life. Uh, they're a herd that has a lot of freedom to move around and behave naturally as animals. On our website, we have a video, a three minute video of our farm practices, and I can send a link to that if you want to see what the tumble wheels look like and what the movable water systems look like that are designed to uh, allow us to have the cattle in the middle of a really large field, um, mowing down different parts of the grass. There's other farmers, let me <laughs> let them speak. Thank you very much. Joan and Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this, is, this is great. And if you would uh, send that, those contact links to um, our wonderful assistant, Linda, uh, okay. I'd appreciate it. Great. All right, uh, next on the list is Nico Horster. Nico? Hi there. Hi. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting us to uh, opine on on this law. I'm not entirely sure how that uh, sort of went by the radar screen of the various farming organizations. I have a beef operation, grass-fed in Versher, Vermont, called Shire Beef. I'm also now vice president, last three years president of the Vermont Grass Farmers Association. 
And we typically pay attention to what's sort of on the radar screen, just like rural Vermont or NOFA. And this certainly slipped by our, uh, our radar screen of what were you guys thinking? Um, I think there's a lot of well-meaning uh, uh, intent here. Um, but uh, I see some major flaws in how this was executed. And hopefully we have an opportunity here to um, point some of that out and you know get into a, a, a discussion about how we can make this a better law uh, for everyone so that the animals are treated fairly and appropriately, not humanely because they're not humans, but appropriate for their species. And, um, um, and the farmers as well. So there's sort of two, two directions that I would like to go with this. The first one is, um, you know, we've, we've gotten together and I don't know if you've seen yet uh, through NOFA in rural Vermont. I don't know, I think Maggie uh, was probably the one who forwarded this, some proposed changes to, to the language uh, of what's described in the bill based already, um, basically basing definitions on already established language in federal law or descriptions of, um, you know, sort of certain conditions that animals are subject to uh, that the USDA, NRCS and so forth already use um, <clears throat> that would be a good starting point for us to define what it actually means, what we're actually talking about. Um, and, um, you know, I just want to reiterate, I heard sort of uh, something, some of what Kimberly said, we are actually, our farm is conserved by the Vermont Land Trust. We have a uh, three and four strand perimeter fence around our entire property, which expressly excludes access to trees as per conservation <laughs> uh, mandates and, uh, you know, uh, and compliance with our uh, um, forestry programs uh, or, or the current loose use program. So um, we have in the meantime, uh, to chagrin of the old timers in town who said, what are you doing destroying a perfectly good hay field planted uh, shelter belts and tree islands in our pastures, uh, because if we ever bale them, we bail round bale them and do not need to have the same sort of dry hay conditions and, and um, uh, that you know, are required for square baling, small square bales uh, as, you know, or loose hay. Um, but, you know, as, as Bob and Joan already said, it's, it's going to take, it's going to take some time to, um, for these trees to grow and provide these shades. You know, that said, I think I would say in the last three years, we've had maybe, I don't know, a week total where I would have said, okay, um, these are, temperatures where the cattle are somewhat uncomfortable. Um, you know, good management, good breed selection, good genetics over time will help with that, like having red cattle instead of black cattle so you can have more heat tolerance. Black hair on cattle is a real uh, downer in, in hot weather. Um, you know, providing enough access to salt so when they sweat, they can replenish their minerals and have an ex efficient cooling cycle within their body. You know, all those kind of things. But um, and I think abuses or non-sufficient knowledge in those areas is definitely something that this law is trying to encourage. And that sort of is getting me to the second part of saying what actually regulates how this is enforced? How do we educate the people who are actually out in the field? How do we prevent nuisance calls and hassle that uh, you know farmers who are plenty busy in summer or in winter, uh, sometimes less so in winter, uh, having to deal with this? And you maybe will hear uh, from Adam in a little bit about you know sort of what he's experienced. Uh, uh, in terms of, you know, neighbors calling, uh, you know, the state police or uh, and then having to deal with hours and hours of education, not just of the neighbors, but the police and, you know, for something that were perfectly acceptable conditions, if there was a qualified panel to actually uh, look into this kind of stuff. And the big question, why the hell is dairy exempt of this? You know, dairy cows, as Bob already pointed out, are way more susceptible. They're much more fragile creatures. And why are we not regulating them in this law? You know, so if, if my beef cattle have to be sheltered, why do the dairy cattle not have to be sheltered? You know, it's again, one of those things that, you know, the holy cow of the dairy industry in the state of Vermont uh, cannot be 
regulate it, apparently. Thank you. All right. I, I think, Nico, um, the reason is that uh, dairy cattle uh, come under different sets of regulation and that may even be more stringent than, than uh, what we're dealing with here. So, but we can check that out. Uh, let's move on to Dave Martin, who is uh, the owner of Settlement Farm. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to, to, to listen to me. Uh, I run about 100 ewes and I'm getting ready for lambing in March. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I, I guess I, I want to acknowledge that most of the public in Vermont knows very little about agriculture. Uh, they, just, they just don't, which is, I understand that and, that, and that's okay. They have some sort of basic knowledge and they like cute scenes of uh, goat yoga, uh, but that's it. And, you know, I people drive by uh, on my place on the road, they see something that might concern them. Uh, I really think that in order to take care of agriculture for Vermont, we need to be prepared to deal with those concerns in an upfront uh, way. If somebody calls in a complaint about how animals are taken care of, that's an opportunity to educate the public. And I think agriculture and farmers need to always be prepared to do that um, because wishing it wasn't an issue doesn't make it go away. Uh, people are gonna drive by your operation and see something that concerns them. And we need to, we need to be able to deal with it. Some of the, the issues I have though is if somebody uh, calls somebody uh, and complains about the uh, way my animals are taken care of, do I get to know who made that complaint? Uh, do I get to know the exact details of that complaint? And I, I don't know, I throw that question out. Uh, if somebody drives into my yard and says, uh, I'm here investigating a complaint, I wanna know who made that complaint. So that's sort of an uh, issue that I, I throw out. And the other thing that, uh, a question I have is what is the nature of complaints that have come in over the past three or four years? Uh, does anybody track that on a statewide basis? What kind of complaints come in? Is there a, is there a, t a trend? Uh, the only ones I've heard about, I've heard about a dairy farmer a while ago who passed away. His son was supposed to be taking care of the cows and he did ran out of money to feed them and the cows were dying in the stanchions. Then I hear about uh, a, a, a couple who had a wide menagerie of animals of goats and sheep and cattle and uh, they weren't taking care of them and the health department came in and a lot of them were confiscated. So I've heard a couple horror stories, but I do not have a picture of uh, on a statewide basis over the past couple of years, what kind of complaints come in? I, I think that would be useful information. Uh, I would also like, to be sure that if uh, somebody drives in my driveway to do it, uh, an investigation or whatever it's called, that I have confidence that they, they know agriculture, uh, that, that they are comfortable and knowledgeable about what are stand appropriate standards of care. And then, and then that sort of would reassure, reassure me. And I'm also so sort of willing to acknowledge that uh, when you create a, a, a law, uh, it, it cannot be, uh, it cannot address every single issue that's going to come up. That's just not possible. Um, there are always going to be situations that are kind of gray uh, and it will need to be addressed. So I, I, I do not want to think we're asking folks to create a, a perfect statute because I don't think there is one. And then another question I have is a lot of times when the legislature creates a statute, a law, so that the law is passed, the governor signs it, oh, that's all good. But usually an agency is responsible for, for translating that statute into a manual to the guidelines about how to handle and interpret the law, a procedures manual. Is there, is there something like that exists for this law? Uh, and, and what happens, and so if a call comes into uh, anybody, a state police officer, the town service officer, uh, the town clerk, uh, where do they turn, turn to for guidance and how to interpret 
and implement the law? It, is there a manual? Uh, that's my question. Um, if not, I'm guessing that if there's not a manual, that a lot of folks would find a manual helpful. And I think that's uh, I, I, that, that's my uh, extent of my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, so uh, I think I, eventually I'm going to want to say something here, but I think what I'd like to do is have all of our farmers and those who want to testify, testify, and then I'll make my remarks. Uh, next up is Amy Braxmeyer, and she was having some trouble with her connection. Amy, if you want to try and testify, um, I, I would recommend leaving your video off, or you can try it with it on and see how you do. Um, but um, give it a try, Amy. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, so real briefly, um, I'm a farmer, um, but I also, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, was heavily involved with Spring Hill Horse Rescue out of Vermont. And at that time, we had developed an animal cruelty reporting system for the state of Vermont. It was Animal Tracks, um, and it allowed every, all the animal control officers throughout the state to go in, as well as the state police um, it was a great tracking system that we had developed um, so that any cruelty complaints um, would be filtered through that system so we could see repeat offenders, um, you know, and that sort of thing. And I think that's really gone by the wayside as our way to track cruelty cases <laughs> in the state. I know that's something that Dave had um, just talked about. Um, and you know, so right now I don't think that there's an agency or anybody that or a way to track those to see, you know, how our repeat offenders are happening and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and from my work with the, the rescue and going on some of these cruelty cases, a lot of the offenders um, were typically not farmers that were out there to essentially make a profit, but it was more backyard farmers, you know, collected animals and that kind of thing. Um, and I saw a big area and opportunity for education through my work um, with that program. Um, and that's kind of, you know, where I'm coming from is the animal cruelty and the reporting cases. But just like Dave said, a lot of the calls that we got were from people who were you know, general public and on educated about livestock and that sort of thing. Um, and also with my business, uh, mobile goat grazing, um, it's hard, you know, for me to provide a shelter on these different areas. You know, my animals will get moved, you know, once a week or twice a week to new properties to provide the service of mobile goat grazing and brush clearing and that sort of thing. And it's detrimental to my business to be able to have to establish some sort of adequate shelter for each move that we make um, and that sort of thing. So, um, but I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have a bit, you know, about my work with um, the rescue many years ago. And some of the cases David talked about, you know, as one of the investigators that went out on these cases and I can provide some feedback um, around some of the stuff that I've seen and some of the work that we did. But once again, that it's gone to the wayside for now, but. Thanks, Amy. Um, why don't we move on to Annie Hopper, then we can skip back to Adam Wilson, who I see is here now, and then we'll go to Graham. So Annie, why don't you go ahead? Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Annie Hopper. I run Scuttleship Farm with my husband. We're in um, Panton in Addison County. Uh, we run beef and pastured poultry and lamb and all of our all of our grazing animals are 100% grass fed and um, we're actually also animal welfare approved we're currently animal welfare approved until we get sick of dealing with them because for similar reasons as health hero they're um, not always I don't think always rational in some of their more detailed <laughs> like restrictions. but in any event it is the highest like tier of animal welfare third party certification that exists I think worldwide, at least that's what they claim. I mean, it consistently is referenced as like the strictest protocols. Like, so we have, you know, been certified with them at the beginning of our farm. Um, 
we also we so we've got about 200 acres 70 of which are on the shores of lake champlain uh, and the other 120 ish are rehabbing cornfields that were just barren wasteland after decades of intensive extractive dairy management just nutrients in everything out take it to the barn it's going to end up in the lagoon anyway our soil looks like the moon so i just i don't know i'm not going to really comment on language because i feel like this is that's y'all's department you're going to get that better than i am but i wanted to give you a little bit of context um because i really feel like this rule for as i'm reading it and looking at it it's like you guys are really going hard on like regulating the trees but there's a whole forest we're missing here. And I just wanted to put that in context because these dairy cornfields that we're regenerating with our grazing animals right now, we're using the livestock as a tool. They are not the center of our farm, you know? And we need to think about like this paradigm of like barn versus pasture-based agriculture. I don't manage animals. I don't wait on them. I don't bring them food. I don't do all of this stuff for them. I'm using them as an active living tool to regenerate our landscape and produce carbon negative meat in a time when people don't even know that hardly exists. So I actually see what we're doing as a huge opportunity for the future of Vermont agriculture. I mean, no offense, but like, Dairy's real, really, really struggling right now. And our topsoil is all in the bottom of Lake Champlain, along with so much of our nutrients. And our pastures have been nuked by glyphosate. And it's just like, this is what's gonna bring it back. You know, pasture-based agriculture is making money in Vermont. It's capitalizing on the Vermont brand. But when you start regulating, it's gotta, you gotta have a shade, you gotta have a this, you gotta have all of this coddled stuff for these animals. They are not the same as these dairy machines sitting with blank stairs tied in a barn. I mean, converting feed. They don't need the same requirements. I mean, I mean you guys have heard that like quote, right? The uh, ship is safe at harbor, but that's not what ships are for, something like that. I mean, these animals evolved from grazing herds in the plains. They don't need an umbrella. They just, th so, so much of this stuff is, I think really missing the mark. I mean, if my animals are wasting away because they can't handle the, uh, the climate or my management, I'm not farming, I'm losing money. I mean, so this, isn't a, this doesn't really seem to apply to farming, it's about animal cruelty. So in any event, just I'm thinking like, I really would encourage you guys to think about like the future of Vermont agriculture and what we actually want to encourage. Is it more like sequestration of live, livestock into barns to just convert feed into food? Or is it going to be pasture-based? Is it going to be, you know, up to speed on the most progressive like regenerative uh, tools in the grazers toolkit? Like for example, when I, when I graze, we're, we're moving every day. Every day our animals move to a smaller patch of grass on our fields. And sort of like the, um, the guys at Health Hero, they're um, with their tumble wheels. You know, we are out in these big cornfields. That's what we got. That's what Addison County's got. There aren't trees anymore. We got rid of them for dairy. So this is how we're bringing it back. But that involves bringing them into small grazing cells where we cluster their animal impact, spread their manure, and then rest. In order to do that, I can't have shade in every single paddock that they move day to day to day to day to day. But then again, they don't need it. I mean, because as Nico mentioned, these are not dairy animals. They don't need everything. These guys have like genetic selection to have been pasture-based. They're shaggy cows, my sheep, look like Vikings. I mean, they're, it's, there's just so much nuance here. And I really feel like we're driving, diving too much into the hole of like barn-based agriculture. And so I guess that's my, that's my biggest rant on this is like, we really need to think about like what the future of Vermont Ag is and what we're actually encouraging and what we're going to hamstring with um, some of this more, I don't know, traditional language in terms of the needs of an animal um particularly a grazing a grazing herd um and i i would um before i um 
I wrap up, I just, I would also like to issue a general, I don't know, cry for some attention. This is not the best use of time or energy for you guys, for tax money, for any of it. Um, dairies being totally exempt. I understand that they have RAPs. I understand the agency of ags there. It doesn't matter how many papers you give the fox if he's still in the hen house. The agency of ag promotes and enforces the dairy industry here. It's not compatible. So to ex like exclude that, it's just like, well, there goes most of our farms in question. I, I just, I can't see how this is helping anything. It's just making more hurdles for the people trying to do things regeneratively. And I don't know, continuing to turn a blind eye so that you know our confinement-based dairy industry here can continue to churn out cheap food at the expense of our like our our regional health our hunting waters our fishing waters our recreation our tourism industry and everything else is laid on the altar of cheap food right now and i just that's your forest and i i really don't think these trees need to find thank you thanks annie all right why don't we turn to adam wilson adam go ahead and introduce yourself please You're muted, Adam. Uh, so my name's Adam Wilson from Brushbrook Community Farm in Huntington. We graze sheep and cows. And um, I'm sorry for arriving late. I'm wondering if there's a specific prompt that would be most helpful for me to respond to or something that would be most helpful in terms of what's already been said for me to add in here. I don't think there's a specific prompt. It, it would be your concerns about um, the bill uh, regarding adequate shelter for um, livestock. Okay, sure. Well, I can, I mean, one thing that might be unique about my uh, experience <clears throat> is that um, like some others here, I've been grazing for some, some significant time, over 20 years now, and employing this, uh, these grazing techniques that we call intensive rotational grazing or management intensive grazing. And, um, <laughs> what's changed for me, so the animals seem to get healthier and healthier and um, thrive in the conditions that we uh, ask them to work in, which is often outside in the sun in the summer and uh, outdoors in the winter months as well. And what changed for me uh, was that a couple years ago, we moved to a new farm where all of our fields are visible from the road and we happen to have a few neighbors who are very impassioned animal rights uh, folks and have picked up the language in this bill um, to uh, work first with the, um, the animal control officer in Huntington who fielded phone calls through the summer months from these um, specific neighbors and repeatedly told them, go talk to him. He's a really nice guy. Those are the best cared for sheep in Huntington. They're out there every day moving the fence. Go talk to him. Uh, didn't hear from them directly, uh, and then eventually um, the state police felt like they had to respond because it was their duty, and um, we've now been through multiple rounds with the state police and generally found the state police to be very thoughtful and in actually interested in learning about the health of the animals and the grazing practices, um, but what it struck me, I guess my reason to get involved here and help to push this forward is as someone who's been grazing for 20 years in the state, I have a huge amount of contacts and network um, at, you know, Sam Dixon at Shelburne Farms, someone who's one of the sort of grandfathers of rotational grazing in the state is my, started our sheep flock and um, I have a lot of people to call on. And so I wasn't really concerned that our animals were gonna be taken away. Um, you know, but there, when I, 20 years ago, when I had started, if this same thing had happened to me, trying to do the best I could, having, you know, apprenticed under people who'd been grazing for decades and decades and decades their whole lives, I might have given up and stopped and stopped farming. Um, the pressure might have been intense enough. And from what I hear from um, folks at Extension and from the state police is that the pressure, the um, animal rights, agenda is increasing in its intensity and its pressure upon farmers 
who are grazing in the public view. And what, it, what ends up happening is that farmers end up moving to land that's not visible from a busy road. And for us, uh, we're a community farm in that all of the food we raise is shared with folks who live within a mile of the farm. We actually give all the food away. We're, we're, we call ourselves a gift economy. Um, but all those families are, are eating the lamb and beef and the animals intimately. And we have the opportunity to educate um, about the health of the animals and their interaction with pasture, why we ask them to work in the sun alongside us who are out there working in the sun, what that does for soils. Um, and so we, we see it as a huge benefit to us to be, we're adjacent to the school, we're, we're grazing on some of the, the Newtown Forest land, the open field portions of the Newtown Forest. We're super integrated with the town, but because we're all, our animals are in the public view every day of the summer and every day of the winter, um, we've become sort of a lightning rod for this specific um, impulse to um, extend. We've decided humans have to um, one step to these animals. Uh, and so it's just, it's been an interesting journey and I'm really so incredibly grateful for all the folks who've put time into this to try to do something to improve this language. And like a couple of people have said, no matter what this, no matter how detailed this law gets, it's not going to account for the thousands of micro factors that go into deciding each day where to move the animals what pasture to put them on, which days of the summer to, to break their rotation pattern, to move them into a shade paddock, uh, the breeding, the genetics, the state, state of lactation, the um, historical presence of parasites in various areas of the pasture. Um, there's just no way that that could be legislated. So um, I think this language that's being offered is a good first step um, to make it a little bit better, um, but really, uh, as others have said, it's going to come down to what the response is. And, and I guess in my case, the response has generally been thoughtful. Um, and but it has taken a lot of time. I mean, we're talking with so many hours on the phone and in meetings. And um, I've been able to handle that and continue farming, but um, it's not everyone who could. So I guess that's that's my hope is to make this better for others who are trying to um, do the right thing for their animals and their landscapes. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. All right, I think we have Graham left. Graham, would you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey folks, I'm sorry to be off video this whole time. I've been dealing with this little one. This is Juniper. My name is Graham Yuning Strupernock and I'm the policy director at Rural Vermont and I'm also a farmer in, um, I lease land in Calais, Vermont and Grays. Um, you know, I think I really just wanna to, to try to just wrap this up from <laughs> Our perspective, working with a number of the farmers in this call and with NOFA and a number of other organizations, um, you know, as Adam and Kimberly and other folks mentioned, you know, this issue does go well beyond this language um, that we're suggesting, but we really do feel like this, this language, at least, um, it begins to, to get at some of the most problematic natures, nature of this, of this law and how we've seen it um, impact some folks. So again, the, the general message is that we're taking wording, which implies based on um, some correspondence I had with Ledge Council and John Bartholomew, which um, implies that animals need access to shelter at all times or um, shade at all times and suggests alternative language based on national, national organic program standards, which says basically that animals need access to shelter or shade at times of inclement weather. And then we go to define inclement weather to, um, to some extent um, based on some, some different extremes. But as folks have said, there's only so much detail we can get into. And hopefully what we can see is also a broad interest amongst these folks yes, to, um, to, to, to work beyond this and to collaborate with you know, responders, um, to think about what kind of training is appropriate for folks who will be responding. And just to understand that you know, the, the legislation cannot adjudicate what needs to happen in the moment and that people are gonna walk into all different types of situations on farms. What we're trying to do here is make it such that folks like an Adam situation who are in the public view, who are you know, pasturing animals in, in particular ways, 
um, are not disproportionately impacted by a law that's really supposed to be assuring animal welfare and may not actually be reaching its goal. We just want, we do want to make sure that animal welfare is achieved and we empower folks who are responding to those to really legitimate situations to, to be able to tend to those animals and um, work with folks who are in those animals work in those situations, but we also want to make sure that that um that progressive grazing uh, techniques and that animal welfare, as we understand it, is is also understood and is protected. Um, folks have talked about sort of the general trend towards confinement versus pasture management and some of the concerns around you know public literacy and also spoken to this being an educational opportunity for the public and that there's really an opportunity here to to speak to some of that lack of literacy. And I think there's a question of how we can do that collaboratively together as well. Um, and maybe one of the last things that maybe wasn't spoken to in which in talking to some folks who work in agroforestry I've spoken to is the potential implications of this for, for trees, the, the, the way the law is currently read where it requires access to shade or shelter. So what can happen in an area, for example, and I have, a, I have a, a particular field where if I'm moving through four paddocks without shade, if I were to, to lane back to the same tree over and over again for a week, that tree's root system would potentially take on enough damage to cause long-term damage to actually kill that tree in the long term or cause damage to trees in pastures. Um, so there is also concern, as folks have suggested, that, that folks don't, it's not that we don't want shade in our pastures or adequate um, tree support, it's just that we, we're not there and it takes time to get there. Um, I know when talking to folks in the agroforestry community, we really love to find some more funding as well to support um, pasture-based agroforestry projects and um, <clears throat> appropriate use of tree crops in pastures as well. Um, and I think, I think that looks largely all I wanted to focus on and, and thank everyone for, for coming to testify and thank the committee for, for your time today. Um, I'll leave it there for now and happy to respond to questions. Okay, thank you, Graham, really appreciate it. I, I guess I wanna start off by saying that, uh, you know, I've heard it, I've heard this, and maybe uh, this isn't accurate, but I heard that I've heard that um, uh, rural Vermont and um, and NOFA Vermont were not given. This was sort of a surprise, and that um, you all weren't you didn't have an opportunity to testify. And I want to be really clear that this bill, which was H two fifty four, was introduced last year, uh, two years ago. And I just looked it up on our on the website, and it was introduced on February fifteenth, two thousand nineteen. It was, um, and I'm I'm really wishing John Bartholomew was here, but Terry's here, and Terry reported it on the floor, so um, <clears throat> maybe he can chime in here. But um, it was read a second time, which means it hit the floor on February twenty sixth of last year, so before the pandemic hit. And then it went through the process. It went to the Senate on March 10th uh, of last year. And it, it, we, it went through the process all, you know, like during the June session and was finally approved by the governor on June 23rd. So it's not like this was a big surprise or um, we it came out of you know, nowhere at the 11th hour with this bill. And um, so I'm, I'm a little perplexed at that. Um, and I want to just touch on a few things that have been said. Um, the word humane doesn't really have anything to do with humans, you know, the application of humans, but it means having or showing compassion or benevolence. And the example that's used in the dictionary that I'm looking at says regulations ensuring the humane treatment of animals. So, um, um, I think that the intent, and this is where I really wish John was here, the intent was to make it clear that to actually separate uh, constructed shelter and natural shelter, to make it clear that natural shelter was okay as well. You know, there were certain requirements of constructed shelter, but that natural shelter be um, you know, just a place where animals can go to to get out of this, get out of the sun or out of the rain. Um, and I'm just going to tell you that we, my husband's project, I have sheep. My husband has um, 
Scottish Highland cattle, but are standing up in a field that I can almost see from here. And they have no constructed shelter. They have natural shelter. So uh, I understand where you're coming from. And if we can improve this, uh, we might be able to, you know, we can try, um, but this was not a big surprise. All right, so I see um, Rodney Graham's hand is up and then Terry. And so Rodney, you go ahead. I, I just want to add on to, to this is, uh, I, I really, I believe our biggest intent was try to protect farmers from the groups that uh, showed up at the farmer with the state police. I mean, we were trying to protect uh, and, and being that it's required to have shelter doesn't, doesn't mean you have to have them in there all the time. They just have to have the opportunity to, to go somewhere. So, for example, let's just say you had a day where you, were, you had your animals pastured in an open field and it's 100 degrees and humidity is 95% and the animals are all standing out there <laughs> panting. Are you just going to leave them there or are you going to let them go somewhere where it might be more, a little more cooler? Um, you know, our, and again, like Carolyn said, we worked, did a lot of work on this bill and it took for a long time, over a couple of years, with a lot of different stakeholders and, and so on. And um, there's no way it could have flew under somebody's radar. You know, it did move fast at the end because of the COVID, it sat there on the counter for a couple of months. And, and, but at that point, we thought everybody was, all the stakeholders were happy with it. Um, but again, our, our main intent out of all this was try to protect the farmers from these uh, animal rights groups. It was not to try and make hardship on the farmers. Thanks, Rodney. I, I'll also let you know that I've asked Linda to review the people who uh, testified on this bill over the last two years so that we can find out who was actually there. Uh, Terry, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, I just kind of want to reiterate what uh, Carolyn and it's already said that uh, we worked a long time on this bill. We took a lot of testimony and a lot of, uh, you know, back and forth with that. And I, <laughs> you know, we were, we've heard from, I remember the, one of the beef farmers from down near Randolph. I mean, he, he was really uh, concerned about, you know, he wanted to be able to use trees and, you know, for shelter and, you know, but there's going to be animal rights activists, uh, no matter what we do. I mean, they are there, they're, we see them all the time. I mean, they're, they're after hunters, they're after farmers and, you know, you can't stop them. I don't care what kind of a bill, but we were trying to at least give uh, the people that enforce the calls, state police, uh, sheriffs or whatever, something to go by to look at that animal and see if they're humanely treated because you can't expect the sheriff to come by or state police and with no uh, veterinary knowledge or husbandry about animals to decide, well, is that, you know, beef cattle, maybe a little too thin for a beef cattle. I mean, they don't, that's a lot to ask for somebody. So um, I guess I'm willing to look at the, uh, the bill again, but I don't, uh, I don't like the implication that we snuck this through because it's, it's not true. I mean, we worked a long time on this. Thanks. All right, thank you, Terry. Uh, Maddie's hand is up and then uh, Rodney and then Nico. Yeah, I just wanna respond. I don't really feel like there was an implication made by myself or anybody else that the committee snuck this through. Um, I don't believe that at yeah. least- was can people mute, please, if they're not actually, if they haven't been called on? Thanks. Um, 
I actually started my testimony by saying that we understand that the committee spent a lot of time on this last year. And I think, you know, NOFA Vermont, um, we take some responsibility for not having, you know, weighed in on this sooner, but we also are, you know, we have one person working on policy for our entire organization and just have limited capacity to be in every place at once. So um, I'll just say also that we weren't invited to testify on this bill, um, which, you know, would have made sense given that we certify over 700 producers in the state um, who utilize grazing practices uh, who could have weighed in on this. And I think it's also just demonstrative that we have this many farmers that we were that are were interested in testifying on this bill, um, given less than a week's notice. You know, there are a lot of stakeholders in the ag community who just weren't heard from for whatever reason. Um, and I would love to just focus more on the issues of substance here versus any you know implications of blame because I also think that's pretty normal in the course of legislative business to revisit laws that have been passed um, once they have started to be implemented and we learn that maybe some improvements are are needed. So um, we're not coming to you with you know a moratorium or a uh, in in just judgment of the committee's actions. We are coming to you in good faith in hopes that we can improve this law while also understanding, like so many have said, that it's probably impossible to get it perfect, um, but that we think we can do better and hope that the committee will work with us to do that. Thanks, Maddie. I have a question for you. Um, do you work cooperatively with rural Vermont? Here and there. Okay, because typically there's somebody from either NOFA or rural Vermont in our committee. And, um, and, and also typically if people want to testify, they ask, and I, I am generally extremely um, accommodating to have people testify. So, um, you know, I, I'm sorry if you weren't invited, um, but I, I think my understanding is that you all work cooperatively. I know that um, there are lobbyists sitting in our in our committee and uh, you bring up a subject and two minutes later, somebody from someplace else in the building shows up because they've gotten texted by that, the, the lobbyist who's actually sitting there. So um, I, I too want to move forward, but I also think it's really important to kind of correct some of the things that have been said today. And I have heard that we put, that we, you know, somehow this happened so quickly and we kind of snuck it in and people were surprised. And um, I think that if you're paying attention, there shouldn't be any surprise here. So uh, I'm gonna go in the list, uh, down the list here. Rodney, uh, Terry's your hand, did you just not take it down? Um, Rodney, you're next, then Nico, then Graham, then John O'Brien. Yeah, I just want to respond to a message of put in chat here. Uh, how many uh, representatives have uh, actually passed your cattle? Um, <laughs> my family farms and pastured in cattle since 1916. If that helps you out, there's other other members of this committee that have or or are pastured animals. Yeah, I think that there's maybe only one who, and he grew up on a farm. So uh, I think there's only one who does, hasn't, maybe Vicki, I don't know, Vicki, if you've had animals. So maybe Tom and Vicki haven't had animals that they've pastured, but the rest of us certainly have. We did um, when our kids were growing up. <laughs> there you go. All right, Nico. Well, thank you. That is very reassuring to hear that there is actual field competence on this committee and that was my impression and what really surprised me and I this is not about blame game or something like that and how much time you spend or what it was but this is an impractical and completely unenforceable law that was passed and I think what we're trying to point out is not that we object to animal standards, humane uh, treatment of animals, species appropriate uh, emulation of uh, artificial herd movements based on natural instincts and all these kind of things that are wonderful. But what you're encouraging, and I think Annie pointed this out in, in, in the chat as well, you're encouraging the 1916 uh, no insult intended here, uh, management. And we've moved on in, in how we manage pastured animals. We don't set stock anymore. We can have all these tree groups and shelter and permanent shelter in every paddock and 
if that's if if that's if we're going back to these old times, but that is land abuse. It is carbon wasting. It is detrimental to the water. So we, what I'm seeing as a farmer here is very conflicting mandates from my conservation easements, from my forester, and from my land management practices, uh, you know, as we are part of the, uh, you know, our farm is part of the 12 uh, uh, pilot farms in environmental excellency in environmental stewardship in the state of Vermont. And now what this law is telling me is that a good chunk of the management that I'm held responsible for that I feel is really important to do gets thrown out by a mandate that is nonsensical, does not make sense to the appropriateness of, uh, you know, is not appropriate for animals. Um, there, there's just no need to provide shelter at all times. And so what we're trying to do is clarify the language at, you know, at the get-go so that it becomes something that even a state trooper, and again, there's no insult in, uh, meant here, but they're not animal experts unless they also happen to be a farmer or having grown up on a farm or know something about that, but that's not a job requirement for them. So maybe we need to think about who is actually enforcing this. Who are the people who come out to the farm? Are they actually competent to evaluate the situation? This isn't a crime scene. This is an agricultural setting. So, or, you know, there's no domestic violence or, you know, this isn't part of a training package for state troopers or, you know, animal welfare officers in our town. This isn't a stray dog they have to catch and keep overnight. So I think, I think my frustration here is that, that the law is very broadly written. There's no clear parameters that I and a farmer can say, okay, if I don't do this, then that happens. And here's who I call. Uh, if one of my neighbors makes a nuisance claim. And so it feels like a big amorphous sort of net that got thrown over us to entangle us in all sorts of different barriers. And maybe that's an overly defensive stand, but the, 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 the real issue is also, you know, as I already said, I have so many different other mandates that I follow, I cannot reconcile them. So I think we need to look at all of what farms are subject to in regulation already and how that can be incorporated in a reasonable, practical, applicable way that we can actually implement in real life. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, Nico. Um, I'm uh, aware of time and I have three hands up. So I'm gonna go through these hands and then we're probably gonna have to wrap this up and we can revisit it another time. Uh, Graham, you're next, and then John O'Brien, and then Heather, and then we're going to have to call it. Thanks. Um, yeah, to double um, to reiterate what Maddie was saying, you know, I don't believe that Maddie or myself came to this testimony with any blame or implication that something had been snuck through. But I will also reiterate what she said that we all have very limited capacity. We had, we have me as a part time policy person who's not full time in the state house. We had Caroline and Andrea there last year. Even if they were sitting in committee, the reality is that we all have different experiences and we read things differently. And me as a grazer might look at an animal welfare law in June when I'm back from paternity leave and, and find out that, hey, you know, there's, there's something here that actually might be a problem. And then we start discussing it with folks. You know, and like Maddie said, that's sort of just the process of the legislative process. You know, folks are going to try to try to improve laws. They're going to have different impacts and we're going to try to respond to them. And that's sort of what what our mission here is today. And I just want to also respond to the, the shade versus constructed shelter thing. And, you know, we weren't critiquing that division. What we were doing is seeing that the NOP, the nationally recognized federal, you know, standard does articulate both the possibility of constructed and natural shade, but it also um, creates, uh, doesn't require access to them at all times. And I think that's what we're trying to ask you to recognize is just not realistic or in the best interest of animal welfare necessarily. That it's like, it was the situation which, I believe Representative Graham was describing where it's 100 degrees, there's X humidity factor. That's exactly when it's on the farmer to say, hey, we really need to assure that these animals have the protection they need, depending on their breed, et cetera. But, but if it's 65 degrees and cloudy and a neighbor notices they don't have access to shade or shelter, that's also not a reason for them to be able to be enforced upon for animal welfare abuse. And that's what we're trying to correct is, is find some reasonable way of saying it's just not all weather in which they need access to shade or shelter, but it's particular times and environmental conditions which mean that they need access to shade and shelter. So that's just the clarity I wanted to bring there. And thank you all again. Thank you, Graham. John, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Carolyn. Um, <clears throat> even though I'm, well, I'm a sophomore on this Ag Committee, uh, I thought what is partly missing here today is some context of 
uh, as I understand it, and Carol and, and Terry and Rodney, you could probably uh, uh, improve on, on what I'm going to say, but <clears throat> I understand that this committee, it deals with animal cruelty and that there was legislation done in the past on, on the sort of pet side of things, dogs and cats. And then the, the issue of we need to update uh, the humane standards for livestock. So that's where this came from. And we all agreed that that body conditioning of body condition of these animals was the most important thing, but almost impossible to, to legislate. So the next best thing was gonna be adequate shelter. <clears throat> and that's where this bill came from. Uh, there's also a sister bill we haven't really talked about, which didn't, which didn't make it through um, about sort of redefining who an animal control officer is and, and how they would go and enforce the adequate shelter um, law. And hopefully that will come back up. And I think the two work really well together. And without that, this, this whole, this law may seem like it's missing something. Um, I also feel that this is, when we were hearing testimony on this bill, it wasn't at all about all of you here today. I mean, I think almost any farmer who's, who's a member of NOFA or rural Vermont or, or a certified uh, um, animal welfare certified, these aren't the farmers that ever um, get in trouble. This was really about, you know, somebody with their backyard horse with a rib showing um, or, uh, you know, clearly some, some animals in a field that it's too hot and they can't get get into shade or it's too cold um, and, and they're poorly fed. And that's, that's what we were trying to um, improve their situation and where this bill came from. So I think if there are unintended consequences, like you all feel you're gonna get <clears throat> a lot more um, harassed now, then, then we can certainly make this legislation better. I mean, this, this committee, we're always trying to make things better. So, so thank you for coming in. Thanks, John. And Heather, why don't you go ahead? And then we're going to have to end this for, for today. I guess I'll, I'll just kind of second what Representative O'Brien said as well. And I, and I do think that there is space mm -hmm. to collectively acknowledge the frustrations that were brought forth today on both sides. I think that obviously this is something that farmers are feeling really intensely. And I think that from what I know being so new to the committee that this was not something that was intentional at all, but I think that it, it would be important for me to know as a new member if this is something that the committee is going to take up again after hearing testimony. And that's just where I'd like to refocus it because I think that that is what the issue is at hand here. Okay, thanks Heather. And we can talk more about that as a committee. And so I think we're gonna wrap it up for now on this topic and we're gonna to turn to Heather Darby. Uh, we thank you all for coming. Uh, you are um, welcome to stay on, but I want you to understand that this is uh, gonna be an opportunity for Heather Darby to talk about all of the interesting innovative things she's doing in terms of agriculture in her shop. So you feel free to leave as you want to and um, and I agree, um, John, that was really helpful in, because we're not trying to make it harder for farmers. We're trying to actually make it better. So thank you. All right, Heather, you've been so patient. You've been here and we appreciate that. Um, thanks to all the farmers who, who, um, who joined us today. We really appreciate it. And, uh, and we, will, we will talk about working on this to make it clearer. All right, Heather, go ahead. Great. Hi. And uh, it, it was uh, fascinating listening to the, the previous conversation as well. And um, it's always helpful to hear everything that's going on. And I'm sure everybody just noticed that it's easy to know what's not going on and then watch something slip through and then feel totally unprepared, like having no idea that it just happened. So I think, you know, it just made me realize um, how easy it is, especially on a farm to just have no idea what's happening up here in Montpelier. <laughs> I mean, and I hear that from dairy farmers all the time and just really trying to 
Um, and Linda can attest to this the other day when uh, you were wanting to hear from different farmers and I was like, hey, <laughs> you know, you have to make the time to do this. Um, they need to hear from you and you need to have a voice and, and we can't um, regret what happened afterwards and just getting involved. And I think it's just a, it's good for all of us to understand that it it's hard to get everybody engaged. And I see, um, you know, folks from rural Vermont, NOFA Vermont, who I work with all the time and just still not always knowing what's going on. I don't know how to overcome it, Carolyn. It just seems like a constant battle, um, but anyway. <laughs> well, thanks Heather. When you know, you when you work on something for two years and you have lots of people in it. So we'll pull up the list of folks who, um, who testified and we'll see who was there and yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, no, and it was interesting, you know, the, the hard thing I think, um, again, another lesson, um, you know, just listening to all of it is like, how do we keep our, our agricultural community united instead of um, not united? And, and, I, and I'm not saying that in any mm. given way, but I think we hear that a lot, whether it's dairy farmers coming in feeling, that they're being pushed up against against some other farming type or or you know strat whatever label strata whatever it might be to you know some of the folks we heard today feeling the same way about the dairy industry or vegetable farmers feeling like nobody cares about them and you know how do we there's so few farmers left anymore in Vermont um, you know whether they're they're dairy or vegetable or hemp or hops or whatever everybody's trying to do it's you know, how do we, how do we bring everybody together so that we're, you know, the ultimate goal is that we have a healthy, vibrant agriculture in our state that produces excellent food and, and an excellent environment around us. And I feel like that's the ultimate goal for all of us. Yeah. Um, and, and it's hard to still hear, you know, that, and it's uh, on all everywhere, you know? Yeah. And, and Heather, you know, one thing I just want to interject here is that I think one of the one of the things that we're coming up against is um, the uh, influx of many people. This has been going on for years yeah, and years. I know. <laughs> influx of people who don't understand that it's okay for horses to be out in the field I know. in the winter no, I know. as long as, you know, like that whole tension. Yeah. I get and, those calls too all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, not. okay. On why don't you tell us something about something else? <laughs> yeah, something else. Now All for right. something completely different. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I was thinking a lot about like what of all the things that we do should I share today? So let's not let's not start with animals. <laughs> let's instead focus on a couple of other things and then move back to some of the work we're doing in in livestock. Um, and, you know, I think everybody knows that, um, you know, we've been working in hemp now and um, now since like 2015. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot happening in Vermont as well as all over the country and uh, really trying to figure out like, where do we fit? Where does Vermont fit in, in, in the world of hemp? And when I say the world of hemp, I truly mean the world of hemp because, you know, the exciting thing about um, hemp being legalized is just all the opportunities that it can bring um, to, you know, new businesses and industries and um, agricultural production. But when I say the world, it's, a, it's for everybody, right? I mean, hemp's actually a crop that can be grown pretty much everywhere. So the legalization of growing industrial hemp in the United States means almost every farmer in this country has that same opportunity. So there's nothing, you know, we don't really have any like cutting edge um, opportunity to grow hemp here just because it grows better here. Um, you know, it's whatever opportunity Vermont or, or New England decides that we're gonna carve out for ourselves. And I think, you know, much like all the other excellent agricultural pr uh, products we have coming out of Vermont hemp will follow in those lines. You know, we will need to come up with our niche, um, the products that have, you know, that Vermont quality with it or, or ingenuity that we see, um, you know, such as 
what you know darn tough socks or bernie mittens or whatever it might be you know where where we fit with hemp and i think you know we saw the cbd boom come in we were all excited about that i think you know all excited that some of us might pay our farms off and just you know off an acre <laughs> acre of hemp and you know we we probably could have seen where that was going to head and certainly you know it, there has been quite a bust there but it's you know not something that we should be thinking about giving up on it's just really the start and that's what's exciting um and so through you know my program at uvm and now growing number of faculty at uvm starting to work in hemp um you know i think everybody sees the opportunities that lie in front of us and so we're continuing a lot of our research um we have been holding this industrial hemp conference now this will be its third year um and you know i will say it's considered really one of the best in the country and and the fact that it's virtual this year you know it's hard for all of us but it does give us even a broader audience to draw from um, and we have speakers from all across the country and canada speaking at the conference um, people email us because they want to speak at the conference which is kind of rare usually you're begging people to come but um, it is you know it's an excellent conference and part of that is because we really focus on um high quality research-based information that's really growing now that hemp um, has been grown more in vermont so here's just a flyer i did send the link to linda before so if people are interested in attending um, you can also attend and then watch everything you know a week after the conference because it is virtual um, and we've been doing a lot of education and outreach and training and again i think we have really um, gained a lot of, um, I don't know, I guess respect for being, you know, really ahead of the curve in hemp education. And again, high quality, uh, bringing in the best researchers that we can. This is a program that we're in the middle of right now um, to train service providers. So not farmers, to train, you know, police, <laughs> bankers, um, fire, fire uh, fighters. I mean, all kinds of people that need to know about hemp um a call from the new york state um, drug enforcement this year because you know their uh folks were flying their helicopter over top some hemp and then they raided this hemp field and harvested it all and burned it and um you know this was a farmer that was registered as an industrial hemp farmer and this is still happening and what the guy said to me was well it should smell like marijuana and you know the thing is that it doesn't matter if it's industrial or it actually is recreational marijuana it all smells the same <laughs> like thc doesn't actually make hemp smell it's everything else in hemp you know all the terpenes um the same terpenes that are found in hops are found in hemp they're closely related so when you think about that citrusy um, or piney scent of beer when people are using hops and beer you know it's the same thing that's in hemp so though that you know characteristic smell doesn't come from the fact that it has high thc so there's still a lot for people to learn and understand if we're going to grow this industry um and you know same with on the the farming part the lending part all those things so this program is still going on and i think i mentioned before we had know, 170 some odd uh, people register you know from as far away as australia you know swaziland like all over the place people coming um for for good education so um so we have a lot to be proud of in vermont we are definitely leading the way in both research um, and just education so we're you know our, my research in general and education is focused on on fiber grain and flour so flour not like flour you bake with but this kind of flour the flower bud the inflorescence of the hemp and you can kind of see all those white um, they look like little hairs which they are in a way excuse me those are all the trichomes um, on the plant they kind of glisten and they're the, that's what's full of oil you know and so that's where the terpenes are that give it the scent that's where the uh, cannabinoids are so the cbd and the cbg um, and lots of others as well and and the thc so it's all 
uh, really concentrated in this flower, in the inflorescence. Um, and that's why there's so much focus on this for CBD, because the concentration and the levels of those cannabinoids are, are the highest in the female flower. Um, and then if the female gets pollinated by male pollen, just like everything else um, in biology, you can produce um, an offspring. <laughs> and so, you know, this is what hemp for grain looks like. And so this is a, a pollinated female plant right here. And if you, if you can look kind of closely, you can see right here, um, you can't probably see my pointer, but you can see thing to form. Um, and that kind of brown area in there are all the little seeds and the husks are starting to fall off. So that's, you know, grain and, whoa, that's my, um, <laughs> and so here's um, the seed, hemp seed. And then here's some work we're doing on um, oh, pressing oil. So we are really, I'm sorry, this was pre-recorded and now it keeps playing my recording. <laughs> Um, and so here's something that we're really starting to focus on here in Vermont, which is like double cropping. And again, this, you know, this is actually in Europe um, where they're combing right here with this like comb. They're combing off the flowers and the leaves to basically bring this to an extraction plant. And then below here is a sickle bar that's cutting down the rest of the fiber and laying that out to be picked up and utilized for fiber products, whether it's maybe hempcrete or bedding for animals. So there's a lot of interest in the double crop opportunities, and that's where we're starting to really focus um, a lot of our attention. So lots of exciting things there. Um, we produce good yields of grain in Vermont, and here's uh, four years of, of our grain yields in 2020. We were, um, we had pretty, we had decent yields. They were over a thousand pounds. Um, we just heard a presentation today from a, a grower this spring growing grain hemp in Manitoba for 20 years. And he said his average grain yields are about a thousand pounds. So we're right in line with that. We had a bad year in 17, um, but overall, you know, we can get really good grain yields. And I think there's some, um, good opportunities here for, for local farmers and local businesses to grow the grain and extrude out the oil um, and use the, the meal cake that's left uh, for different purposes as well. So um, lots going on in the world of hemp. So the, I'm sorry about that. Let me see if I can get my voice to stop. <laughs> um, you can see it's got a little recording in there. There, just delete it. So, you know, when we're talking about environmental aspects of hemp, um, it's, it's not an impact-free crop. You know, there's a lot of interest around this um, and you hear this a lot, especially you get hemp evidence to come in the room and you hear all, you hear all kinds of things that it's gonna do for the environment. Um, and, you know, most every crop that's grown um, can have minimal impacts on the environment. Um, but every, almost every crop that's grown can also have really negative impacts on the environment. It's all about how it's managed. And we heard a little bit about that um, already from the folks that were on before. You know, there's good grazing management and there's really bad grazing management. Um, there is really good corn production and there's some that definitely is leading to erosion and runoff. And so it's really about how we develop the way we grow these crops and what we set the standards right from the get-go. And so hemp can have really positive impacts on the environment, um, but it can be really negative as well. So, you know, you hear things like um, hemp um, doesn't take any fer fertility. That's not true. It uses a lot of nitrogen phosphorus and potassium, mostly potassium and nitrogen, just as much as, as corn, if not more. Um, and so, but it can have a low impact, but that's also generally surrounded um, by hemp that's grown for fiber, not hemp that's grown, 
you know, in these really wide rows like CBD hemp is with plastic and so on and so forth. So it can have a real positive impact on the environment, but you can see right here, this is a study in 2004 in Europe. It says that that requires good agricultural practice production, <laughs> which, you know, we know what that is in Vermont, right? So you can see that hemp, you know, has very low levels um, of many of these, but it's really under a scenario that allows for best management practices. So it can be really good for the environment as long as it's managed properly. Um, so that's one of the things we're really looking at. We know Vermont uh, is not gonna be like the only crop that farmers can grow on their farm or should be growing on their farm, it needs to be a part of a rotation. And I'm sure you've heard this a lot, you know, good farming means that we have good rotations if we're growing annual crops. And so really figuring out where does hemp fit in these rotations? What does it grow best following or before? Um, and, you know, trying to understand is hemp benefiting the rotation? Um, are there challenges? And where does it make the most sense to include it on our farms in Vermont? And that's really, you know, the question that we're focused on now. Um, and it does need to be rotated. It, you know, it can do things like sequester CO2 um, and put organic matter back into the soil. Uh, but again, you're not growing hemp every year. That's not good agricultural practice um, and it doesn't lead to good outcomes. So it's really figuring out where hemp fits. So that's kind of our, our newest work. Um, I wanted to mention, we, we definitely are still working in hops. There's, uh, I don't wanna say more interest. I, I feel like we had a lot of interest in hops probably six years ago and now um, we're, I, we haven't seen a lot of new farmers coming in uh, to growing hops in, in New England, but the ones that are there are growing and um, trying to figure out how to um, show that their product's unique. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But as part of our work in hops and hemp and, and education, we've delved into the virtual reality world um, and using VR tools. So here's Keith Silva, who some of you probably know from across the fence. Um, he's trying out our virtual reality educational tool um, that we developed for hops. Um, it's a hop, hop VR and you basically go in and you scout the hops uh, using this virtual reality tool. So it's a way to learn how to scout um, and to identify insects and diseases in VR in the winter time uh, when hops aren't growing so that you're prepared and ready to go to the field in the spring. So we are creating another VR tool like this for hemp. Um, and we have um, two VR tools, one that's in beta right now called We Farm. And we farm is a VR tool that we created for um, ag students that are in high school to learn how to implement uh, best management practices on a virtual reality farm to improve the soil health and protect the water quality. So it puts them into a farm scenario um, where they can pick practices, identify issues, and um, really understand what, you know, what cover cropping is gonna do for the soil health um, and the water around them. So that's, that's this is <laughs> exciting and delving into something, obviously I don't have a lot of experience in, but trying to create these tools um, for the next generation. All right, so here's another one of my recorded things. Um, I wanted to talk about cereal rye a little bit. So we hear a lot about winter rye um, for cover crop. And one of the things I've been really interested in is can we add value to the cover crop? So as I'm sure you're well aware, there are so many farms, you know, that have, are leaving dairy as we speak for various reasons, have um, or other, you know, farming types that are looking for opportunities, you know, looking for options. And we're really interested in expanding um, grain production, cereal grain production in particular um, in Vermont and, and all around us. 
um, because we do have so many local bakers and distillers um, and, you know, other food products from granola to um, dog treats. I mean, e pretty much everything. And all of that grain is sourced from outside of Vermont. Very little grain is used uh, um, that's local in bakeries um, or, or distilleries in Vermont. And we have an opportunity there. We have an interest from those end users. And so we're trying to expand. There's a lot of challenges here, but winter rye felt like the easiest one to work with because many farms grow winter rye. There's 30,000 acres of winter rye grown for cover crop. What if even 5,000 acres of that rye went to mature, produce seed and fed back into distillers? bakeries or malters um, or cover crop seed. And so really thinking about how to take some of those acres and add more value um, to the farmer. So we've been looking at rye in particular. Um, it does well in Vermont on poor soils, wet soils, um, and farmers are used to it now. So it's kind of taking it to that next level. And I, I'll just highlight one of the projects we're working on. This is at Borderview Farm. Um, new members probably haven't seen it or heard of it, but it's our research facility up in Alberg. Um, and so we're, we're trialing winter rye varieties. We're looking at fertility management and harvest timing, um, and then taking those varieties, those harvest dates, and turning those over to bakers and distillers to try to figure out, is there a particular winter rye variety that if our farmers growing would make a good loaf of bread or a good bottle of whiskey. And so we've been doing a lot of work on that in our lab, trying to figure that out, um, harvesting, like I said, different varieties at different times, um, and then sending those off, like I said, to bakers, to the end users. And here's Randy George, many of you probably know him from Red Hen Bakery. Um, there's some of the rye, he's making a rye bread. He's looking at different varieties um, and different harvest times to figure out what quality of rye makes good bread. And, you know, it's probably shocking that we don't have the answer to that actually anywhere in the country, um, but we will, we're working on it. And it's really um, very exciting. And the farmers obviously are really excited about it too. Um, just generating this kind of information, just showing you guys a few pictures. So here's the bread that they baked with the different varieties. You know, the score sheet actually do use a scientific process to go through this um, and the results um, and you know, what we figured out and we bring this back to the farmers and let them know, like, uh, don't grow. Um, if you grow hazelnut, it makes a better loaf of bread. Uh, but, you know, the falling number, which is a quality parameter, declines rapidly across the harvest season, where Danko, the bread doesn't taste as great, but it's more stable in the field. So really trying to figure out uh, varieties and then uses. So we have a lot of projects like these um, focused on grain, um, corn, like different corn types. It's very exciting trying again to create different opportunities um, with the business we have here in Vermont that are really interested in using local product but can't access it. Um, so I will go back up. Um, I wanna talk about our sensory program. I mentioned that to everyone. I'm gonna go right to here. Um, we started, I hired a, a sensory scientist last September, <laughs> right before the pandemic hit. And my goal for um, hiring a sensory specialist, who is a person who many of you might like picture as that person that can like, you know, swirl the glass of wine and, you know, sniff chocolate, something or other. And you think to yourself, yeah, it tastes like a bottle of wine. Um, but Roy DeRochiers, is a nationally known, a globally known sensory specialist um, that came into my life really <laughs> oddly 
and um, and really at a perfect time where he um, was he just lost his job actually at Tufts University, uh, their loss for sure. Um, they closed down the center um, that he was a part of, and I was working with him on a dairy project. And I said, well, do you want to come to Vermont with me? And he said, yes. So now we have a person in Vermont that has this, you know, just the skills and the know-how um, to help us develop um, really high quality products that are going to be, you know, winners with consumers all over the country, really. Um, and it's really, it's really exciting. And I'm just going to show you one example of some of the work we're doing with Roy and uh, with milk and another project with cheese. So um, we have a grass fed milk project where Roy's role in this project is to understand the sensory components um, of grass only milk. So this is milk that is only produced uh, from cows that are fed grass, pasture, legumes, um, stored stored legume or grass, but they're not fed any grain. And this was a very quick growing market a year ago until the pandemic hit, and now it's it's slowed a little bit, but it's still um, presented an opportunity for a number of farms in Vermont and beyond. So, um, what we're really doing is figuring out, you know, uh, what factors drive overall liking and consumption. So what is it about milk that consumers like and what's driving consumption? Um, and what is high quality milk flavor? And then kind of going backwards from there, figuring out um, what's happening in manufacturing and then what's happening on the farm. And this work, you know, really hasn't been done for grass milk, which is a very unique product, and very different. Um, we're also combining this with nutrition work that we've been doing at UVM. And we have found that grass-fed milk is just like real grass-fed milk is superior in nutrition um, to the point where we're, you know, at a point where we're gonna conduct a clinical study. Hopefully we'll get the funding for this um, because it's that much, it's that much more nutritious. Um, and this really, you know, who knows? It's got to taste good because I think we all know <laughs> nutrition doesn't always drive our purchasing uh, preferences. I just ate a bag of um, chips, you know, so they're not very nutritional, but I like the taste of them. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot to this, but really trying to figure out um, can we influence or change management on a farm to change the overall aroma and flavor of the milk? Um, and then in manufacturing, are there things that we can adjust as well? Um, and then, you know, on the other end, it's like, well, what do these consumers want? And one thing I've learned from Roy is consumers say they want one thing, but actually really want something else. And so doing the work to study that is really important. And he always makes this point, especially with like beer, people will say, oh yeah, I like a really hoppy beer. But then when you give them a really hoppy beer, that's not the one that they choose they like the best. And so he says the same thing with orange juice. Um, he helped develop Tropicana orange juice. And he said that um, consumers said they wanted fresh squeezed orange juice. So when they lined up fresh squeezed orange juice with different levels of um, orange juice that had been like slightly processed, they didn't pick the fresh squeezed orange juice. And so had Tropicana gone with that, because that's what the consumer said, um, they wouldn't be the number one selling orange juice. And so really it's kind of understanding like what are our consumer preferences um, by getting them to taste the milk and pick the one they like. And then a trained panel that we have now at UVM because of Roy can say, okay, this is the one consumers liked. And the thing about this milk is it has a slightly um, clover taste to it. And they always like that one. Okay. Um, so they liked it. There's not very much aftertaste. They're going to go back and they're going to keep buying that milk. So what gives it that clover taste? So then you start tracking back 
you know, is it something in the manufacturing? Is it something on the farm? Um, and that's what we're doing with grass milk and it's, it's really cool. Um, so here's um, some data. I mean, just to show you how different milk can actually taste. Um, this is from across the country and from different times of the year. So this is grass fed milk purchased off store shelves um, from the East Coast, the West Coast and the Midwest and then also during the spring, summer and winter months. And you can just see that, um, you know, winter milk is different than summer milk in terms of its aftertaste and its overall richness scale. Um, and, you know, the, the spring milk and the winter milk kind of commingle a little bit. And, you know, certainly might be because they're getting stored feed, right? They're not out on pasture. So it's really trying to figure out like, um, what is it that's creating these differences? And what is the milk that people generally would wanna buy? And how do we make that um, type of dairy product? And so here's East Coast versus West Coast versus Midwest. And of course we have the most data points from the East Coast, um, but you can see they're also like more scattered um, more variation and, you know, where the mid Midwest points and even the West points um, are a little more consistent. So, you know, our farms on the East are really different uh, because of their scale and their housing types and even what um, kind of forages they have to eat. So we would expect it to be different, but how and is it better? Is it richer? Um, you know, what what kind of claims can we make for our area? Um, here, we have started doing this analysis with the dairy farmers so that they can actually see um, how their milk tastes and how it's different. Um, and so this, somebody didn't just fart here, if that's what you're thinking. This is like part of the training, you know, you hold your nose and you bite a gum drop and then you undo your nose and then you can like, you know, taste the peppermint. Um, so it's kind of like when Roy always says this, you know, parents always tell their kids, hold your nose when you take your medicine. And he said, that's the worst thing to do because the minute they undo their nose, it makes the intensity of the taste of the medicine just like a hundredfold. Um, so don't do that. But all of us at the Organic Dairy Conference last year trying all these milk samples um, from different milks from, you know, different, um, different processors. And here, I mean, you get this you can see this, you know, just different people's reactions to some of the milk. So really trying to engage the farmers all the way through the value chain so people understand, um, you know, why management or processing or whatever it is really is going to make a difference. So with Roy, we are doing with this with a variety of other uh, products too. So right now we're working on flint corn and different um corn uh, and working with some of the tortilla makers in Vermont. So um, All Souls Tortilla and Vermont Tortilla Company. Um, also working with our um, indigenous uh, families as well. So we've been working with the Chief Stevens and the Nilhegan Abenaki tribe as well as the Oneida tribe out in the Midwest. So um, really looking at this way beyond just our farms. Um, we're working on artisan cheese now. We're just starting that project with the new Dairy Innovation Center. And we're working with distilled spirits, as I mentioned. I mean, Roy's been doing a lot of work with Caledonia spirits to help them put out, um, you know, a really, not that their product isn't already high quality, but they have some new aged products um, and Roy's helping guiding them with that. And then of course, we're working on hops and malt as well. So, um, you know, at some point, especially when we get to be in person, we'll make sure Roy gets in to talk with you folks and share some of this fun work we're doing. Um, just a huge asset to Vermont for sure. So um, I don't know how much more we have time for, and I'm sure you have questions, so. Um, I don't even know what time it is, Heather. Um... Oh, it's quarter quarter to uh, three or so. <clears throat> so we have plenty of time. Um, I, I wanted to let you know that I, I've told you about these hops that grow down in my stone wall. 
We're going to come been... get those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you're welcome to try. Um, they're in, they grow up out of the stone wall. I wanted to let you know I made beer last year oh. and it was fantastic. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, yeah. We've enjoyed mm. it a lot. So, so the interesting thing, oh, go ahead, Carolyn. No, 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 you go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, we've been collecting these wild hops from around New England now for quite a few years and growing them up and trying to evaluate them. And um, we recently got contacted by Haas, H-A-S-S, which is probably the largest hop broker in the world. And somehow they saw that we were collecting this germplasm and they, yeah, they were like, where are you getting this? And, you know, can you share it? And so on and so forth. And um, probably not going to share it, but uh, just interesting. Uh, yeah. That people are really interested in the old, mm. old hops. They're looking for something new um, because of the craft brew industry and this sort of demand for something different. And I think they've run out of, um, they've run out of like genetics, I think that are interesting to them. So they're searching. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, do you, are you still doing anything with milkweed? Yeah, so we are, um, we've been working. So we still have our milkweed trials and plots going up at border view and continuing to, um, yeah, work away on production and harvesting. Um, the company in Quebec, as I think I shared, went completely belly up. Um, oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, and yeah, it's been a battle, especially for them in Quebec. It's been really difficult. Um, we have some new opportunities locally. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to really say about it, but there is a, quite a bit of work going on locally um, to to develop the market a bit more. So we are still plugging away. Fantastic. <laughs> Hopefully we'll, yeah, we'll see something happen. Um, yeah, so on grass-fed dairy, I had mentioned I'm doing a lot of work in this area because, you know, there was a huge push <laughs> Um, and really high pay prices um, back in 2016, 17, and 18. Um, and, you know, we just had farmers in the organic realm, especially just um, wanting to get rid of grain and start feeding grass only to garner, the, to garner these higher pay prices. Um, a lot has changed since then. So the pay prices have really leveled out. Um, you know, from what I understand, the demand for grass fed is still really high. Um, but just, you know, the markets in general with COVID, just everything going on, they've kind of, um, they haven't been taking on new farms for sure. What they're doing though, is allowing farms that are already, um, you know, in Organic Valley or Maple Hill Creamery to move into grass milk if they have an opening. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's not growing as fast, but nonetheless, I know this is like of wide interest in our state. Um, and so I wanted to share some of the cost of production data and information so people can see a little bit um, what it costs <laughs> to produce grass milk. Um, and it, it comes at a pretty significant cost. So we've looked at the cost of production on 28 farms in 2019. So it's actually 2018 data. And then we've continued to do this. So we do have 2019 data and working on 2020 data, but it hasn't all been summarized yet. <clears throat> and so here's a little bit about the demographics. Um, so it's about a 50-50 split between Organic Valley and Maple Hill Creamery. Maple Hills in New York, um, and their grass only everything in Organic Valley, people are familiar with them. And then locally, we also have some farms like uh, Larson's, um, Butterworks, you know, they're all grass as well. So they were in this study. The average herd size is 61 cows, but the farms range from 28 all the way up to 200 cows that were not being fed any grain. Um, but this is the part I think is really important here is that it takes about six acres per cow. And, you know, I guess if I put this into perspective for, for you, most all of our farms in Vermont are at less than two acres per cow. <laughs> um, and 
so it takes a lot more land, right, to be mm. grass only. So for a lot of farms, it's not even a possibility. You know, they just don't have the land base to be able to make that conversion. Um, and so even farms that would like to do this, they don't have the land or the land around them or the money to buy more land um, or secure it because you ha it has to be secured. It's not like, oh, I have it this one year. Um, and I would say on ash, we did a national survey and the national average was about five acres per cow. So, you know, around here, it seems about six. So it's like triple what we normally see. So triple the land base. Now, so you're kind of, maybe you're wondering, well, why? Well, you know, if you're feeding grain, you have to replace that. And so, you know, you're not bringing anything onto the farm necessarily, but you got to still feed those cows a certain amount of feed every day. And so you're replacing grain with forage and it co comes at more, you need more acres. Um, here's the average milk production. And so if you know about like milk production for many farms, you know, some of our high producing conventional farms are at, you know, 24,000. Um, I would say, you know, organic in general, it's like 14 to 18,000. Um, and so you can see with grass milk, you know, we're anywhere from 4,000 up to 14,000 um, pounds per cow per year and in the average about 9,000. So they're producing less milk, need more acres, um, and yeah, so, you know, there are some, some real factors there. It's not that easy just to switch over. So here's a different farm expenses. Um, here's the maximum, um, cost cash expense cost on, um, the, uh, grass milk farms that we looked at. So there's four, basically $46 a hundred weight. Um, and the average was $24 a hundred weight. And then the minimum was 12. And this was a, um, this was actually a conventional dairy, um, trying to remember what the, uh, there were some different circumstances here, but nonetheless, you can see that, you know, farms have to at least on average, you know, be getting $24 a hundred weight to, to break even. And again, these are just cash costs. Um, so there's things that are not included in here. What I found most interesting from this um, cost of production uh, work that we did was that the biggest cash expense was purchased feed. So if you looked at conventional dairies or organic conventional dairies, I guess. I don't know what else. So we have grass fed organic, then we have organic that feed grain and pasture and whatever. And then you have conventional dairies that might feed grain, it might also just be pasture. Um, generally their biggest cash expense is purchased feed. So it's like regardless of the type of farm we're looking at, the biggest cash expense is purchased feed, whether it's grain, or forage. So, you know, I, I thought this is really interesting because I think that a lot of people have this perception if I go grass, I don't have to buy grain anymore. But look at what people are having to buy. They're still having to buy feed. And at least, you know, to be honest, at least grain has a consistent quality. With forage that you're trying to buy, you know, you're at the whim of the season, right? If it was a good season, or a bad season. Um, anyway, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to note here, which I also found a bit frightening, was the small amount of money that was spent on seed and fertilizer. And, and the reason I say that is because on a dairy farm generally that feeds grain, you know, they're importing nutrients onto their farm. So we hear a lot about this, you know, from an environmental perspective. But in this case, if they're really feeding mostly um, homegrown feed and not bringing in concentrates per se, um, they may actually be drawing down pretty drastically the fertility of their fields, um, which might be causing them to actually have to purchase 
So, you know, I've noticed this a lot on, on um, some of these dairy farms is that they're not fertilizing. And as a result, their yields are much lower. Um, and hence, they're buying feed, you know, whether it's grain or hay or whatever. And so just thinking about how do we help people start to fertilize their fields so they're getting more homegrown feed off of those acres. And would that reduce the number of acres from six down to four, right? So, I mean, there's a lot going on here, but I just, you know, the point being that this isn't a perfect system either. And it's certainly creating an opportunity for a number of farms, which is that have really excelled. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have some grass only farms that have really just figured it out and are producing 60 pounds a cow, right? Where the average per cow um, for many of these farms is about 14 pounds. Um, and so if we have farms that can produce 60 pounds of milk per animal, um, just off from homegrown feed, like that's a lesson for everybody, not just our farms, not just grass only farms, but all farms, that's where we want to be. Um, and so how do we get there? Because that, that's a, that's huge from viability, environmental, uh, perspective, you know, everything, um, how do we get more homegrown forage into our animals and purchase less feed? <laughs> anyway, so I just thought I would share share that with you. I don't know if anybody has some questions about that, but. No, that's fascinating, Heather, that you've uh, gotten all that data, really amazing. Uh, committee, do you have any questions for Heather on this or anything that she's already spoken about? All right, Rodney, Rodney, go ahead. No, I don't really have any questions. I just uh, wanted to say it's pretty pretty typical. I mean, I did grass fed for several years before the milk company decided they didn't want to milk anymore. Right. Or they didn't want to come down the hill to get it. But, um, and um, the only thing I would say was different that my fertility didn't go down in my fields. Um, you had to manage it a little bit different, but we were able to keep the fertility up. And yeah, it took a lot more feed. Prior to going to grass fed, we, we were in a position where we sold a lot of feed. And uh, so when we when we switched, we, we had plenty of feed, we just weren't able to sell some. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to draw it out. The rest of it's pretty well. Pretty, close to what I was experiencing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and again, the range of farms is pretty significant. Um, you know, we have some farms that are producing seven pounds of milk and you're just wondering like, how, how are they staying in business even if they're getting $45 a hundred weight, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's, you know, and I saw this in some of the reports coming out, and I do think there's some opportunities here for us, especially as we start to connect some of the consumer preference work and um, really trying to think about the terroir of dairy <clears throat> products in Vermont and what does that mean to consumers and, um, you know, really trying to handle on that, especially as we're continuing to improve the overall health of our environment around us um, and people talking about that today. And that's happening, you know, from a lot of different angles, not just from pasture, um, but on our corn ground and in our rotation. So, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, help gain some, you know, I don't know, return on that investment from the marketplace? Um, and, you know, I, that's a question you, you all heard about from the FWA too. One, one of the things I'm, I'm worried about though um, is, is the forages um, and what, I, you know, some of the observations I've been making and research as well. You know, our whole dairy system, our livestock system, um, not just dairy, many of the folks talking before 
I mean, Vermont is is a grass based um, ag industry. That's most of all the ag acres are in grass. Very little is in anything else. Um, you know, even the number of corn acres really is is dwarfed by the number of hay acres. You know, so how is all of the forage? Um, you know, what's going to happen to that with climate change? And, and it's already happening and we're feeling it on dairy farms for sure. And I'm sure at livestock operations as well, um, where we're seeing like these longer periods, stretches of dry in the summer. I mean, last year was, was extreme, but really the past three years, we have seen these like longer durations of dry weather. Um, we always have a summer slump, but it's getting worse. It's getting longer. Um, you know, just these extreme wet, extreme dry um, diseases, less um, intense winters. I mean, we're seeing a lot more issues with our perennial forages. And, you know, that has huge impacts on the livestock industry in Vermont, as well as the environment, you know. Um, and so I think this is something we're play paying close attention to doing a lot of work in, I mean, here's an example of, you know, different legumes we're wor working on different varieties, looking at persistence over time. Um, and, you know, these were planted as pure stands, which isn't normally what we do in Vermont, but mostly just trying to understand what legumes are surviving the best. Um, these were planted in 2017. So you can see by 2020, um, really, it's the alfalfa, shockingly, that held on the best um, over that three, four year period um, where bird's foot trefoil, even the red clover and the white clover in particular, um, just, you know, had, were dying out um, from, from drought, from winter kill, from pest pressure, um, and again, just these extreme kind of climate variations. So how do we combat this? This is a huge issue for us. Here's um, a picture from this year. Um, this down here is alfalfa, uh, or no, I'm sorry, that, yeah, this is alfalfa, but um, this is impacted by potato leaf hoppers. And I know people were calling me um, all July and August saying that um, their alfalfa was drought stressed. Well, alfalfa doesn't generally get too drought stressed. What was wrong with it is that we had a huge leaf hopper um, outbreak and we are seeing these more often now and they decimate the alfalfa and the red clover and the white clover and the bird's foot trefoil. And, um, you know, this, it's huge. I mean, people didn't get any second cut this year because, you know, if you drove by some of these fields, it looked like a school bus out there. It was pretty in, intense. Um, and that's how bad it was. It actually wiped out a lot more than alpha, but this probably was the most visual. Um, but up here, you can see alfalfa as well. And this is a potato leaf hopper resistant variety. It's not a GMO. Um, it's just hairy. <laughs> is a hairy alfalfa and the leaf hoppers don't like it. Um, but you know, there's a difference between having something to harvest and, and not having anything to harvest. So these are really important, you know, things we're, we're looking at and just critical, critical, I mean, to the success of livestock operations in our state and everywhere. Um, as, you know, and as a matter of fact, I was just um, awarded a grant last or yeah, in September to do a national forage um, needs assessment <laughs> because you know it's an area that is so important across the globe and across our country, but very little research, very little extension, very little support in general for forages, um, which is should be shocking to everybody considering how important they are for lots of different ecosystem functions. Um, and even, you know, at UVM, Sid Bosworth just retired, who I'm sure many of you knew. Um, he was our forage specialist, and I'm pretty sure they won't be replacing him. Um, and even University of Wisconsin, Dan Undersander retired, I wanna say three years ago, and they have not replaced their forage specialist in the state of Wisconsin. So we're really, um, yeah, I mean, this is, it's not good. Um, and so we're just highlighting this. Here's grass species. 
a wet year versus a dry year. Um, and you know, you can just see the reduction in productivity. And really it's trying to understand which of these species and varieties um, do the best, whether it's wet or dry <laughs> or normal, whatever that is. And that's what we're trying to get a handle on because that's what we need to be really growing out in our fields. Um, and you know, here's, this is uh, from this year it, during drought conditions. Um, and so here's Timothy, blue is first cut, what we got from first cut and, and orange is second cut. Um, and so you can see whether it was orchard grass or meadow fescue or Timothy, um, you know, there was hardly any second cut except for perennial ryegrass, which is not something we grow here very often, but you can see whether it was dry or, or you know, we had some moisture it produced a good amount of yield. And so really looking at that, here's you know almost five tons of yield off of two cuttings is phenomenal. Um, usually that's what we get across the whole season. So, you know, we just we have a lot of work to do here because it's, you know, it's basically the base of of Vermont. Um, and it's important work that we have to do. So anyway, just a little bit on that. <laughs> Whoo! Yeah. Any questions? I feel like I, I feel like I'm taking your um, college course. Oh, uh, I know. <laughs> I think it's really fascinating and so cool that you're you're uh, digging into all of these uh, areas that potentially help uh, our farmers going forward, especially yeah. since we've got climate change and drought, and you know, drought really hit I think in any number of places in the state, including mine. Um, and you know, hay crops are down. Thank goodness, my neighbor did just deliver a hundred bales to us. Typically, we'd get through the year with what we make, but not this year. Yeah, I know. It's, I mean, and a lot of people were in that um, situation. And of course, it, you know, it's not just varieties, but you know, with this whole conversation around um, soil health, building organic matter, you know, all those, all those things really come into play. Um, Oh, shoot, why is my email coming up? Um, you know, as we, um, you know, are dealing with these weather crises. Um, yeah. Yeah. I do, um, I don't know if we have a few more minutes to talk about cover cropping. Um, we, we, do, we do have a few more minutes and that would be really interesting. Okay. So uh, can... Rodney does have his hand up. So maybe yeah. as you can settle, Rodney could uh, speak. Um, I just wanted to, I know last time we were here, you were talking about um, the organic matter, what the, what the average was, um, and I don't remember what you said. Yeah, so the average in the state of Vermont is um, between 5.3 and 5.6 percent. Those are two like big databases that are available, and one one database says 5.3 and the other one says 5.6. So roughly, you know, about 5% or five and a half percent is the average. Um, and I think, um, you know, there, there are fields all around that obviously, but you know, there, there's fields a lot higher and then there's fields obviously lower too. I don't, you know, unless I'm on sand in Vermont, I don't generally see anything much below 3%. Um, but yeah, I mean, a 5% average is really good. And I think I mentioned the national average is about 3%. So, yeah, I had a soil health test, soil sample taken there. It started on that stewardship program. Yeah. I don't know where, what happened to it, but so, uh, on my cropland, I had organic matter of 6.8. And um, my pasture land was 5.8. Yeah. And I was, I, I was grass fed. So you can, you can keep your <laughs> land in shape. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, you know, one of the things, um, so this is the soil health that I was talking about, thinking um, from, you know, this recent work that we did uh, with 30. Uh, conventional dairies in Vermont, well, 29 and one organic farmer that was growing corn as well. And part of the, pro we're 
doing a cover cropping project, but part of the project was to go out and, and collect this baseline soil health of the fields and then implement these cover cropping practices and then look to see if we improve the soil health. And, you know, I, as I had mentioned before, I was like shocked, I guess, when I got the results back and, you know, most of the fields were considered um, optimum or excellent. And there was actually only this one field here, <laughs> you know, the one dot that was below 60. Um, you know, anything above 80 is kind of the best, the very healthiest soil. And then that 60 to 80 is considered optimum. And then when you get below that, it's kind of cautionary, but you can see we didn't have any, like any of those conventional cornfields in red um, or even in, in orange um, and really not even in yellow. So, you know, I was, I guess, surprised. Um, I, you know, I took many of the samples myself, not all of them. Um, and I think I took this sample because I remember thinking, yikes, I'm glad they're in the project. But then even that isn't, that bad. Um, but, you know, we have some farmers that are getting in their cornfields these soil health scores that are like approaching 100, you know? And so part, part of what I wanted to say was, I feel like this is really showing the investment of the farms and the state and the legislature and the agency of ag and NRCS and saying, okay, let's get these cover cropping and no-till and, and manure management <laughs> out on these fields and, and the farmers have done it and this shows it, you know? And, I, you know, I just, it's something to be proud of. And, you know, especially in a time where we're still struggling with water quality, um, probably will continue to, to, to. Um, and, you know, I felt like here, here's the success story for the work that people have been doing. And, um, you know, it's only 30 fields. It's 50, it represents 15, um, actually it represents 3000 acres. Um, so it's not a small amount of acreage uh, that we're looking at, but it's not, you know, huge either. And that's why I was saying like, um, I feel like we need to stop, you know, and take, take this um, to do a baseline. Like where are we actually at right now? Um, like what, what is this? what's going on here, you know? Um, what else can this person do? And I think, you know, just the frustration on the farmer's side and, and other people's sides too, of like, oh, we're doing all these things. What are we even accomplishing? Um, and, you know, the nice thing about this is we also have all the yield data with it and management data. So we can actually show um, like is, um, you know, is, is this healthy soil producing higher yields on this farm too? Um, you know, all these things we're assuming uh, good soil health results in, you know, is it? Um, but anyway, you know, we're talking about sequestering carbon and things like that. And I feel like we can keep forging ahead. I mean, obviously it's doing, doing some good, the direction we're heading, but it sure would be nice to sort of stop and not stop, but just at least measure where we're at <laughs> so that we know when we've hit the next milestone, you know, um, gives us something to celebrate for one thing. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of investment put into all of this and people keep thinking there's no return, but it clearly shows that there is. Um, so anyway, that's why I keep saying, well, oh, we really need to, to do this baseline assessment. Um, and just like, not just on dairy, not just on corn, just kind of figure out where we're at so that we can really make those next strides forward. I mean, it's, this is super exciting. I mean, to me, this was like, wow, okay, maybe we have done something here after all this time. But so that was one thing I wanted to share. That's fantastic, Heather. Yeah, it's really, it's exciting. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and then the other thing, I mean, there's so much, we're just, here's the, you know, the injector that I talked about the other day, um, you know, the Agency of Ag and Agency of Natural Resources both have invested in this grassland injector up in Lake Carmi. Um, and even, you know, given the pandemic, <laughs> We were able to get it rolling this year and, you know, we covered almost 600 acres. You know, we plan to double that hopefully next year. Um, and, 
you know, just keep working on trying to figure out the cost benefits to using it. Um, How have you been coming? You were going to talk about uh, cover cropping and I, that sort of triggered in my mind that um, piece of equipment that you were trying to develop that was sort of a roller. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 How's that going? Good, actually. <laughs> so funny um we have so many farmers that have really adopted that practice it you know the roller crimper um so because farmers are so into cover cropping now um you know the termination end so planting them getting them in the ground but then the next spring having to manage them can be really cumbersome for people especially you know a couple of years ago we had that really really wet weather People weren't able to get their corn in. It was crazy. Um, and a few farmers went in and rolled down their winter rye. It created like this floating <laughs> mat almost, and they were able to get their corn planted. Um, and so it's a really being used on farms to manage, manage cover crops. So um, we're trying to expand that adoption, uh, but there's there's things that have to be figured out. So. Yeah, we are continuing to peck away at that. Um, this is a new project that we're working on called Solar Corridors. Um, and you can see here, there's a pretty big like gap between these rows of corn. Um, this is like uh, 90, I think this is 90 inches. Um, most corn's planted 30 inches with the rows are 30 inches apart. So we're, we've started to expand the distance between the rows of corn to plant cover crops in that area. So here's um, 60 inches between rows of corn. And you can see the cover crop that's established in there. Um, so we've talked a lot about interseeding in the past and trying to get cover crops growing in the corn. And it's really difficult. Um, and so we're trying to figure out better ways to do that. And one way that we've been looking at is increasing the distance between the corn rows. <laughs> and um, it, it works, it works really well. Um, so here's another picture of it right here. Here's the 60 inches between the corn rows and you see the cover crops and here's 30 inches between the corn rows. Um, Here's another photo. Here's 60 inches to the left and 30 inches to the right. Um, so the farmers were really interested in this. Um, it, it basically means taking out one row of your planter, essentially, or every other row. And um, we, we did put this out on some farms. We got great cover crops, ridiculously good. Here's a picture of that or a data slide. So 30 inch cover crop biomass compared to 60 inch. So a lot more cover crop growing, covering the ground, um, which is great. Um, but here's a corn yields. <laughs> um, so here's 30 inch corn. This was this year. So we had 20, about 24 tons. And then in the 60 inch row, we had 18. So it's not terrible. Um, but that's a pretty hard sell, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, last year in 2019, we only saw a two ton yield decline on the farms that we worked with um, at scale. They saw three ton yield decline. So, you know, is the benefit of the cover crop being better established gonna outweigh that yield depression? That is yet to be seen. Um, and so what I'm working on now is getting um, a forage crop planted in between the corn rows and seeing if that will um, provide the additional value that a farmer might need um, to make this system work. And this is some work that was done in Wisconsin where they're planning establishing alfalfa in the final corn year um, and having some success with it. They weren't using wide corn rows, but um, anyway, so the farmers are excited to try this out and we, we just got a grant to do that. So we'll see. That's cool. How, how, do, how do they then um, actually harvest that? Well, so the corn is just chopped off like normal. And like really above, above yeah, the, no. yeah. 
No, nope. okay. so it would just, well, six inches, you know, some corn yeah. would be chopped um, usually at the second node. So you kind of see that thick part yeah. in the corn. It's usually the second second one up. So, you know, it's six to eight inches above the ground. So you are getting some of this um, alfalfa, but really the goal here is that next year when this field would be rotating into alfalfa, it would already be established. Gotcha. And ready to harvest. So what, what a farmer gains is um, an established stand of forage that they don't have to wait an entire year, kind of out of production in a way. Um, to establish that feed. So yeah. a lot of interest here. So we'll see where Yeah, that. that's yeah. really neat. Cool. Yeah. All right. All right, we we are almost out of time, okay. but but it, uh, I could listen to you all day. So um, uh, Gia, was, was there something else you wanted? To, I don't see any hands up. Is there no. anything you wanted to cover? <laughs> I, well, just these last two points, um, again, uh, and again, this is biological activity in the soil and just showing the value of stacking practices, which is what farmers are doing versus using one practice. So here, down here on this end of the scale, so this again, it's a measure of bi soil biological activity. There's no manure in this system. This is conventional tillage with no manure and no cover crops. So that's way at the end of the scale. And so this is no till with no manure and no cover crops. So you kind of get a little gain here in biological activity by not tilling, okay? So then if you have conventional tillage with no manure, but you add in a cover crop, you get a little gain in biological activity. But then you can see as you continue to sort of a, add manure to the system, um, and then B, start to put cover crops into the system, you really get a big boost in biological activity. Um, and you can see conventional tillage with manure and a winter rye cover crop produces very similar, at least with this metric, um, biological activity, respiration, we're measuring breathing, as a no-till system. So, you know, I think part of my point was these practices utilized together are going to give us our biggest bang for the buck. But I feel like there's other ways, you know, it doesn't just have to be no till. Um, and because I know a lot of farmers aren't ready for that yet or just doesn't fit. Um, so we can achieve healthy soils um, with using the practices together, especially in a rotation. And here's perennial forage. So you can see, you know, that's kind of the highest. Um, and then this is just a different measurement. This is aggregate stability. So, you know, this is poor aggregate stability. So that's continuous corn, no manure, no cover crop. Um, you can see what it looks like. And then as you add in practices, even, even, and I say even just, just adding rotation. So just adding hay into the rotation with the corn, even without manure, even without a cover crop, you know, you improve the quality of the soil. And then when you start adding no tillage and cover crop to a rotation with hay, you can see that the quality of the soil, the physical properties can be just as good as perennial forage. So, you know, what this, you know, my point being is that this perspective that corn is evil, um, you know, I heard it a few times, <laughs> and that it's leading to all this terrible degradation. Um, you know, certainly there are still fields out there that need improvement, and I'm, I would say the same for any of the ag systems in place, <laughs> whether they're, you know, they're corn, they're veg, they're grazing, there are fields that need some help. Um, but then we have these other examples that show, hey, we can achieve some of the best soil quality um, with corn in a rotation, with these best practices. And we don't have to lose in the corn years. Um, we, can, we can maintain or maybe even improve by having those rotations. And I, I've said this before, but you know, here's some of the data to back it up um, that clearly, you know, we are just, we're pushing, we're making great strides. So anyway. Fantastic, Heather. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Are there any last little questions from the committee? 
Vicki, I, I noticed your hand up quite a while ago, and I'm glad you put your hand it back up. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, thank you. I, I just was curious, Heather, you always give us a good reality check on everything instead of myth or rumor. We're hearing some great stuff. Um, my question is about the grass-fed milk with all the testing and with Roy, who can help um, with the sensory aspect of milk. Um, is grass-fed milk, you said it's more nutritious, mm -hmm. but does it tend to be more favorable in flavor for, for those who are testing it overall? Yeah, so we have not got to the consumer liking part yet, Vicki, because of the pandemic. But um, so I'm, I'm now a trained um, sensory instrument. And so I'm one of the, the trained tasters. And I can tell you that um, the milk, it's incredible how different it tastes, um, whether it's coming off from a farm or off the store shelf. And so it, it's clear that there are improvements that can be made um, in, on both sides. So we have tried milk right off the store shelf that I would never put in my mouth again. And then a week later, we'll you know do another panel and buy the same product from the same processor um, and it would it'll taste totally different. Um, so I do, and then same on the dairy farms. Um, we, we tasted milk coming right off the farm. It was pasteurized because we can't, we're not allowed to taste unpasteurized milk. But there is milk that um, you'll taste it at first. It doesn't taste like much, but three minutes later, it tastes like you just um, ate out of the gutter. So, I mean, it's, but, you know, on the same hand, um, we, there are other farms where, you know, it's sweet, it's um, aromatic, you know, there's just all, so it's, it's really different. So we know that there's improvements that can be made um, in processing and in management, but now it's figuring out which of those products do the consumers like. Um, I like a little Barney in my milk, apparently. I didn't know that um, until I became a trained taster, but I like a slight Barney aftertaste and that's good Barney. There's good and bad Barney. Um, and so I'm wondering like, will consumers like a little bit of that Barney? It, it's like, I don't know how else to describe it, but it's, it's not bad Barney, it's good Barney. And then you can <laughs> taste the sweetness of the forages as well. So if somebody is feeding, um, I can always tell when somebody's feeding a sweet fermented feed because you can pick it up in the milk. Um, and then you can, we have picked up um, tastes that you could tell somebody probably had feed that wasn't so good, hadn't fermented properly. So anyway, yeah, the, we will find out once we can do uh, consumer testing again, hopefully soon. All right, thanks, Heather. And uh, John O'Brien has his hand up. Oh, Vicki, did you want to do a follow up? No, no, I just wanted to say thank you to Heather. All right, thanks. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Heather, for coming in. Um, I want to ask about 50 questions, but I'll just keep it to two that um, aren't really connected. Uh, one, I just wondered if the dairy industry um, has, has explored um, just to do something different with milk, like a 4% milk or, you know, like you're talking about the taste of milk. So mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, milk, like you're saying, Barney, like if milk tasted like Rowan, uh, <laughs> we might drink a lot more of it. Um, or, you know, I guess the, the PI count is it, the bacteria in it. If, mm -hmm. if Vermont is explored saying having the cleanest milk in the country, um, I'm not yeah. sure we're you know, set up for that, but we might ultimately sell a lot more too. And given our, our you know, the best management practices, we might mm -hmm. be ahead of it where everybody else is. Yeah. So that, that was one. And then um, the other was, I, I thought of this when I was tedding last summer was, is there anything like a reverse round baler where, we take old round bales that aren't used, which you see a lot of, add some, say, manure inputs, and essentially, you know, spray them on fields oh, yeah. to create yep. soil faster. So yeah. I thought that would yeah. be something that you'd like to work on <laughs> yeah, in your free time. That's interesting. Yeah, no, you know, it is true that 
you know, we see the biggest organic matter gains um, on farms that are still using solid manure. Um, you know, um, it's not hay per se, but definitely usually has a lot of bedding in it. Um, and we do see, you know, on those farms, we do see those um, organic matter levels up around 8%. Um, so there, there definitely is something to what you're saying, for sure. Yeah. All right. And on, the milk, I mean, on the milk side. Uh, yeah, are, are well, I'm, I'm with you. I feel like, um, especially with the new Dairy Innovation Center, uh, Laura and I will be talking again, really um, starting to brainstorm, I think, exactly what you're talking about, <clears throat> especially now that we have someone like Roy um, that can really dive into not just, um, you know, the sensory side of it, but the consumer side and consumer liking. You know, he spent, he, you know, he's actually close to retirement. He spent his whole career in industry almost, um, you know, creating products like Jack Daniels, Tropicana Orange Juice. I mean, really like, um, you know, industry favorites, Heinz ketchup, you know, um, and, and we don't necessarily want industry fa favorites, but we want to sell the best product, like a Vermont product that, you know, Roy always says the reason Jack Daniels is the number one selling whiskey is because it really doesn't have much aftertaste, um, which is against what most whiskey drinkers would want, but that makes people want to go back and take another drink. So, so, you know, it's just really, and I know it sounds like deceptive almost, but in a way it's like, those are the kind of products we want to create that people just want to come back for them and more of them, regardless of, of why in a way. Right. So it's really like digging in. And, um, and he always says like in India, um, he's done a lot of work there and he said, you know, moms in India don't care how good it tastes as long as it's healthy, but moms in, in the United States, you know, they're happy that it's nutritious, but it, it has to taste good too. Um, and so just like, you know, really understanding what it is that is driving people's purchases. An environment may not be be the thing, right? Um, we think it, some of us make purchases that way, but a lot of people really don't, but it adds value. Um, so anyway. Heather, thanks so much. This is always, it's, you always uh, inspire me. It's always exciting to hear you uh, give us a, your report. And it's so great to see your your son, he's getting so big. <laughs> I know. You can tell <laughs> I've got him in front of the TV. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's eight now. Yeah. It's crazy. Oh my gosh, time sure flies. I know. It's not. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much. Really, thanks, and thanks everybody. Yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. So, all right, we'll see you. Bye. And bye bye.